this thing was basically worthless. Virgin news! Not your grandma's Metroid game. That'll be 80 bucks. Ah, f that. Hi, fellas. Leo is here. And now, take a look. I finally recovered a picture of me and the game we have bounced from my childhood. And there you have one. What's better than good memories? <laughs> yeah, I totally did that. Now, before I talk about my relationship with the GBA, let's focus on our boy here. Oh, look at it. It's a beautiful it's been alive for two decades. He's depressed now. Handhelds and Nintendo go about as well as a kid on his toys. We'll enjoy his time, nurture them, maybe even give him names, and move on when the next thing comes up. It started with the Game & Watch series when Junpei Jokoi saw a guy playing with a calculator on a train in Halo Revelation. Yes! Just put an image in the background, a set of images that light up depending on the command, and there you go! They made a billion versions of this thing. By the end of the 80s, technology had advanced to the point where they could put NES levels of games on a handheld. And their second big step into dominating the streets came to be... The Game Boy. And to be honest, the first few games were barely imitating the NES ones. At most it was a parody. But throughout the years, designers understood how to properly utilize the capabilities of the console and wind up creating amazing experiences like Mario Land 2, Link's Awakening, and of course, the Pokemon games. That explains a lot. The possibility of not just playing whatever you wanted, but also with friends, trading and fighting, it was what gaming was all about. You didn't need to carry your console with the cables and cartridges, just put your console in your pocket, maybe some batteries and a way to see the screen. Yeah, the Game Boy Line had a serious problem with the screen that you could barely see it under the worst conditions like against the sun or in critical mode. That's when Nintendo released the Game Boy Lite in 1998, only in Japan, thanks for that. It had everything that the original needed, even used less batteries. Full whole has AA batteries, but damn does it make them last. And the same goes for the Game Boy Lite with half the amount. And the same year, the Game Boy Color was released. What was the plan here? This version, just like the Lite, uses only two AA batteries, and as expected, this is just beautiful. The colors are obviously great, but it's the pixel art, man. It just gets me every time. It wasn't about making things look as pixel art as possible, obviously. It was about the limitations of what they could do with the technology at the time. So they tried to push the capabilities of this small ass piece of shit as much as possible. I just love this thing. It's actually the way that I learned about Nintendo handhelds by playing the second generation of Pokemon games and Zelda Oracle of Seasons, but not ages because my mama didn't raise no bitch. And of course, after the success of the Game Boy Line, Nintendo thought about moving towards the future with a new more powerful system. Going back a little in time, Project Atlantis started in 1996. First thought to be the Game Boy Color, this new console would have had a 32-bit processor, a 3 by 2 inch color screen, and a link port. Different magazines had an idea of the actual processor used, but whichever they mentioned, they were all created by Advanced Risk Machines, which created the actual processor using the GBA. In 1998, Project Atlantis was ultimately cancelled so Nintendo could focus on the success of the original Game Boy, and it was deemed too risky to release a successor this early. Nine years after it came out. Funnily enough, in 2009, a predecessor of the GBA was shown, which looked a lot like a Game Boy Color, so Joystick Magazine concluded that this must have been what Project Atlantis could have looked like. And just one year after its cancellation, it was announced at the Nintendo Space World Trade Show in August that two new consoles were in development, an improved version of the Game Boy Color with wireless online connectivity, codenamed Advanced Game Boy. Oh! That name is terrible! as well as a brand new handheld with a 32-bit processor. And one month later, they revealed online connectivity via cell device and an improved version of the Game Boy Camera. This console was released in Japan first, in August 2000, and later the same year for the rest of the world. Probably work around the name. Nintendo also formed an alliance with Konami to create technology for the handheld that would interact with the GameCube, known at the time as Project Dolphin. In August of 2000, the console will be shown running a tech demo of Yoshi's Story, which was mind-blowing seeing an X64 game running on a handheld. Remember that at the time, the most that the Game Boy Color could show was the NES graphics. Looking at it now, it's alright. You can see that it was definitely their first attempt at creating 3D graphics on a handheld, or should I say 3D sprites, kinda like Donkey Kong Country, and man does it move slowly. It was a good foundation, but most people wouldn't have enjoyed it, let's be honest. But where Yoshi's Island walked, many more would run. By the end of August, the GBA was shown in Nintendo Space World 2000, along with the 10 launch titles in Japan, with some peripherals like the Link Cable and the GameCube GBA Link Cable, rechargeable battery pack and an infrared communicator to exchange data with other players. By the next year, the GBA was released in North America and PAL regions with 15 launch titles, with plans for 16 additional games by the end of that year, which was fantastic! They managed to release Golden Sun and etc. 
The Game Boy Advance had a solid first year on the market with a price of $99.99 on release. It managed to sell over half a million units in America alone, making it the best selling game console at the time. And by the end of its lifespan, the GBA has sold over 81 million units in the US, around half from just the original model. The first iteration of the GBA was pretty neat. They overhauled the design of the original Game Boy by spreading its cheeks and having more real estate on the screen. Also two new shoulder buttons, well there you go, now you can play in 64 games. Also uses two AA batteries like the Game Boy Color, so you can last a whole afternoon I guess. And uh, a screen? Yeah, the original model still didn't have backlight or any other way to see the screen without positioning yourself with the correct lighting conditions. So it was just Cuphead playing outside with this thing. And that's where the peripherals come in. Just like the original Game Boy, the GBA had a bunch of guys in the party fighting for your attention. You want this light or this light? What about all this? But still didn't solve the issue that if Nintendo released the Game Boy Light in Japan a few years earlier, why not include that feature in your spanky new console? And it takes the same amount of batteries, so there's no excuse there. Oh, thank God. The first revision of the console, the Game Boy Advance SP, meaning special, was released in early 2003, with a new clamshell design like the Motorola's of yore, which made it pretty much half the size of the original version, with a rechargeable battery, a brighter LCD screen, and an internal light with a button to turn it on and then forget it exists. This guy was everything the original version needed, minus the headphone jack, hold up. Nintendo, I don't wanna hear my family trying to spend time with me, I wanna listen to Luigi. <laughs> it's total things in life. It was all going great, until people realized that the screen was still kinda ass. Sure, there was light, but it came from the sides and it looked kinda dirty when you look up close. So an upgrade came out, with the light coming from the back, making it the ultimate version of the GBA. Still no headphone jack, because Nintendo hates us. This is version AGS 101, while the previous version was 001, so if you wanna go for a GBA, you should definitely ask for that one. Or you could always go smaller. The GBA Micro, which came out the same month as the AGS 101, which, well, true to its name, this thing is invisible. Watch your step. Damn it, not again! And sure, the thing looks nice and all, having basically the same design as the original GBA, just smaller and slicker, but the thing can even play Game Boy games. Oh yeah, all the others can play original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, so this thing was basically worthless. And even worse with the DS coming on the horizon which could play GBA games. So having three versions that could play old games, what did this one have that could make it stand up? Well, you can adjust the light. Oh, well, I guess I'll go f*** myself! The Micro did actually manage to sell over 2 million units, but the SP version sold over 43 million, just over half of the total GBA sales. So like I said, your best bet would be an AGS 101. Okay, now we can move on with my story with the GBA. I didn't have one. Wait, then why do I love it so much? Ah, budget. Latin America is well known as the land of... I can spend money on that. Now that's a different story. So during most of the 2000s, I had to have my feel with... Oh god... It was great! Every weekend I went with my cousin to a nearby internet cafe, downloaded a bunch of games, sit them on a three and a half floppy disk, and try new stuff to see what we enjoyed and build a small library of games from there. That didn't really exist. Emulation is a taboo topic nowadays, mostly for the outside world, but let's be fair, for a third world country, it was either that or play with my friends outside and they were not gonna kiss my boo-boos. So the computer it is! And since I pretty much play on the computer by myself, I didn't grow up with GBA games using the multiplayer components. Mostly because for those cases you also had to buy the cable and your friends needed their own system and sometimes the game. And since we couldn't do all that, video game transactions pretty much would go like Hey man, you got any games? Sure do! I'll be 80 bucks! Ah, f*** that! Me and my friends did share a lot of memories with the games, each playing at their own homes, so they still mean a lot to me. I just don't have a way to show it. That's one of the reasons that I've been building up the game collection. These games gave me years of joy and taught me a lot of things, mostly English, so it's only fair that I pay back. And it feels great to just pick up a game and... Dang it, hold on a minute. And then have a gay old time. So, now that we're done with that, how about we order some of my favorite games in the system? And you might be wondering, Leo, do you even like the thing? What do you think? This is my favorite handheld and my second favorite game system right after the Super Nintendo. Oh, it's gonna be great! Now, before we begin, sorry, let me just prepare something. The GBA sure had its fair share of Mario games, all of them being ports. Yes, enhanced version of the ones in the All Stars collection, except for Japanese Mario 2. Even Nintendo knew the game was donkey ass. 
Funnily enough, the first three games are brighter to compensate for the dim screen the original GBA. But Mario 3 has a normal brightness because by then the GBA ESP was out. By the way, Super Mario Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3. Whoever made those titles, I heard they are serving a life sentence. Why not just call it Mario Advance 1 through 4? I can see where Nomura got inspired. But I didn't really play much of these games because I already have my fill with the SNES, so of course the Nintendo wanted more money. This... This is beautiful. Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga. I've played the first three games, and this is still my favorite in the series. They just made it so good the first time around. The game is just straight up fun. The characters are well written. Even Mario & Luigi have better personality than any other game in the entire franchise, and everyone wants Luigi dead for some reason. He probably knows too much. The gameplay is basically an evolution of Super Mario RPG with time attacks, special moves, and I personally prefer these ones because it's more than just mashing buttons. You gotta time them properly, and they can reach an advanced version giving you basically double the amount of team attacks. The thing that really does it for me is the fact that the game doesn't take itself seriously. Even when the stakes are really high and entire cities are getting bombed, it still maintains this light aura and you just wanna see how everyone reacts, what they say, it's incredible! It is definitely on my top 5 favorite RPGs in the system and my second favorite RPG of the Mario series. Yes, above the thousand year door. Don't worry, the Mario & Luigi series is dead so you got your revenge. Jesus, coulda gone easy on that one. You guys remember Metroid? Nintendo sure didn't during the N64. Oh, oh. Good call. But when it came back for the GBA, they gave us two whole games. One being the remake of the first game on the NES and the other being a sequel to Super Metroid. Metroid Fusion, also titled Metroid 4, is not your grandma's Metroid game. This is a horror game, and you all know why. The ex parasite that pursues you throughout the whole game, you can't do sh to it, you can only run with your tail between your legs, hoping that you can actually escape. This game tells a great story about taking down a menace far greater than the Metroids themselves, and Samus basically has to go against the whole universe to take these things down, and so people don't like the game. It's mostly due to the linearity, which I admit, it is there, but considering just how big the game itself is and the focus on the story, which again, I love, I don't personally subscribe to that notion. And if you are into more open games, may I suggest Metroid Zero Mission. This remake takes the gameplay of Fusion and improves on it, making it faster and shinier. It even adds an extra episode after you beat the game. It has the original game too, Jesus. Another franchise that just boomed on the GBA was the Castlevania series. But now with the original style, they went with the Metroidvania route, starting with Circle of the Moon in 2001, Harmony of Dissonance in 2002, and the third one in 2003. Yes, this was a yearly series. Remember when these kind of games came out like that and it was awesome and we just took it for granted? Just you wait. Anyway, I haven't beaten Circle of the Moon, but people tell me that it's a really good game. I just couldn't get used to the art style and it's been kinda slow for my liking, but I'll give it a shot one day I guess, I have time, never mind. Next we have Harmony of Dissonance, which I have beaten once, and it's way faster. So much so that they added a dash for both L and R, and it definitely helps, but the game itself looks... off. I guess it's because they tried to emulate the look of Symphony of the Night by giving the character this outline that sure makes it stand out. Looks like a cartoon in form of a painting. The backgrounds do look neat, and the music... It's not. It may sound like I'm dissing on the game, but I'm really not. I just don't think it's the best in the GBA, because that one was yet to come. On May 6, 2003, we got Castlevania Aria of Sorrow. This is what people often consider the true successor to Symphony of the Night, and I gotta agree. Not only does the game look far cleaner now, with a smaller outline around the characters, but also being fast without having to use both L and R. Hell, use L for abilities now. And you get abilities from all the enemies in the game, expanding the gameplay far beyond the other games before. Sure, you could attack, maybe use spells, but now you can transform, affect the environment, use whatever weapon you wanted, it's... Ugh! I still cannot decide which one I prefer between this and Symphony, mainly because that one has the inverted castle and the... You don't belong in this world! That. But I can certainly say that Arya is among my top favorites in the GBA, no doubt! Also, the story is not so, so it gets an extra point. 
Moving on, did you guys know that I love the Zelda series and I want Eiji Onuma to announce my wedding and Shigeru Miyamoto to bring the rings? But first, we gotta find them. The GBA had two mainline games, Not Being Port, Four Swords, and the Minish Cap. I couldn't play the first one because of depression, and this one is my baby! So, quick question, what Zelda game I've been in more than any other? <laughs> That's right, I link to the past! Followed by this one. This game, man, I just can't help but smile anytime I see it. It's so beautiful! It was clearly based on the Wind Waker, but it has some things alluding to the N64 games, and it's... I mean, it's a fun game! Yes, it's short compared to the other ones, but by having 5 dungeons, a nice colorful world to explore, people to meet and side activities, this is an incredible game to beat! Don't complete it, though. Sure, you can go for the Kingstones and get every item in the game, but to get all the figurines just for one piece of heart? You pretty much get addicted to gambling with the odds in this thing. It just ruins the whole experience, and trust me, with how strong you can get with the skills, you don't need that lousy last heart. Hopefully. It's funny how developers manage to take their franchises and add stuff to make their characters far stronger, like it's everything they wanted to do with the Super Nintendo but couldn't do to limitations, like getting abilities from enemies or actually playing as a cool character. The Mega Man series! It's good to see a friend that responds to your messages every other decade. The X series got huge during the PlayStation age, until it wasn't. But that didn't deter Keiji Inafune during his prime to take the series into the future, quite literally. And start the Mega Man Zero series one century after the events of the Maverick Wars. It was funny, the first game was almost like a Metroidvania, but then they backpedal and made it into a standard Mega Man game with selectable areas in the map and abilities that can be acquired if you're good enough. You need a high score to earn abilities from bosses. If that doesn't spell don't be a bitch, I don't know what does. And don't be mistaken, these games are tough. Mostly the second one for me, I guess I thought that the X games were going to accessible so maybe more rough and coarse and uh, you got everywhere. But the fourth and final game, even though it was still challenging, you could get all the abilities and create your armor parts and you're just, you're just boss. Some people consider the third to be the best Zero game, but I have a soft spot for the fourth one. I guess because of how incredible the ending is. Also, I don't like the RPG stuff that they include in the first two, so maybe another franchise could have those, damn it. The Mega Man Battle Network games. The perfect example of what's not really necessary. Don't get me wrong, I love the series, but for the love of God! Alright, let's dial back and see what it all went wrong. This is a parallel universe to the classic and the X series where Dr. Lai and Wily didn't create robots but software, AI. And our characters play with the little helpers in their pets, that sounds weird. And our main character is Lan Hikari, along with his friend Megaman.dxe. Surname included. And they must fight the forces of evil. In 3 by 6 grids. By turns. It's funny, the series has RPG style gameplay, but you don't really get experience, only money or chips. But you can upgrade your abilities as you progress through the story. So it's an RPG, but they don't wanna admit it. What? Are you ashamed or something? And the games are fun and all, but my god, they did not need to make six games. You could easily slash the series in half and it still would make sense. Slash it again. It still bugs me when they release the collection and advertise it as Oh, we made 10 games for the console. No, you only made 6 and went with the Pokemon route of saying Oh, we made 3 games in this generation when they made 1, but at least one of them had all the DLC included. But despite that, these games aren't that long if you play through the story and they have multiplayer features. And it's really fun seeing actual players fighting. This easily could have been like an eSport event, kind of like the tournaments in the 4th game. That's probably what Capcom had in mind, but I guess the oversaturation of Mega Man games just made people sick and tired and didn't want anything to do with them anymore. Great choice, humanity. You know what's not oversaturated? Dragon Ball, oh. But on the GBA, we had a really fun beat'em up, platformer, fighting hybrid in the form of Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure. It follows the entire story up until the fight with King Piccolo by mixing long stages with occasional fight, mostly during the tournaments, and then you can unlock a special mode where you can play as Krillin, and then an extra mode where you can play as every character, even the enemies, which makes the Krillin mode irrelevant. Damn, even the game's dunk on the bastard. Overall, the game just looks beautiful, man. The controls are quick and the music rips. 
It's just a fun experience, and for a moment I thought it was an action RPG, until I realized that those numbers weren't the HP of the enemies, just the scores. In 2004. Oh, f you! The score is bigger! And just as a funny side note, on the American box art you can see adult Goku on the background, even though we never played the Piccolo Jr. arc. Probably hinting at a sequel, but this was the only game in this style, at least on the GBA. The other games in the franchise were focused on Dragon Ball Z, with one good fighting game, garbage, and three action RPGs. And by the way, the console was just bombarded with RPGs. Yeah, what about it? The series started with DBC Legacy of Goku. This game reeks. Goku moves slow, is weak as all hell, and the abilities are pretty much worthless. This game is probably one of the worst RPGs, nay, one of the worst games in the console, and the developers should be ashamed. You're forgiven. Now, this is what I call an improvement. Legacy of Goku 2 covers the story from the arrival of Frieza to Earth all the way to the end of the Cell Saga. There's five playable characters with a secret one at the end, and the characters can run. Thank God! You can use special abilities at any time and recover health and key by collecting items from enemies or the environment. It's an action RPG, so the game is just fun and can get frenetic at times with so much stuff going on. And you might actually feel overwhelmed with all the enemies on screen sometimes, so it's always important to grind for levels. Here's a small tip to make the game easier, at least after you unlock the northern mountains. When you reach this save point, go to the left. You can't open the door, but you can attract the triceratops towards you and attack them through the door. Watch out, because they are high level and can kill you if you're not careful. So just hit them from side to side and BAM! Easy level 35 if you want. And you should be golden until the later portions of the story. Anyway, this game is incredible, but I guess they got too many complaints for the difficulty because later we got Boost Fury that, as the game suggests, focuses on the Boo Saga, and uh, I had to be honest, I used to really love this game more than the second one for a while, but with time I realized that it's way too easy. You can level up pretty much twice per screen, which recovers all your energy, you can equip yourself, making you even stronger, you can allocate stats yourself whereas the previous game was automatic, so just go for strength and beat the world to submission. After a certain point, there's no challenge in the game and you're basically playing on... I don't hate the game, but now I feel more fun than for the previous one. It's always good to have some difficulty in your game to feel that you achieved something, even if you have to grind for it sometimes, and well, at least there's only 5 characters to level up and not, oh I don't know, 386, oh hello. Of course I had to mention the Pokemon series, yes I'm doing it. The first games on the system were the third generation, Ruby and Sapphire, that introduced double battles, running, and more a chance to waste on your team. The full Pokemon experience. These games once again were tough, and weirdly enough were well received when they first came out, guess it's a tradition for this series. Nobody hates the Pokemon series like the Pokemon fans. But with every generation that came out, people understood the value of these games. They were beautifully crafted, with so many areas to explore, now two teams to battle, two rivals, and a whole lot of water. I loved these games at first playthrough, but two years later we got Pokemon Emerald. the definitive version with animated sprites now being able to fight both enemy teams, more Pokemon available, and the Battle Frontier never played it. These games sold like pancakes during the lifetime, becoming the best selling games on the console. Though they didn't sell as well as previous generations, I guess it's because people were outgrowing the franchise which has been happening since, right? Obviously. But the success of the third generation led to the remake of the first games, Fire Red and Leaf Green. Little note here, this is my preferred way to play the original ones, it's just faster, there's no glitches, psychic tags ain't f***ing broken, and there's so many quality of life improvements, including a way to repeat fights to grind for levels and cash the hell out. Also it helped to bring the Pokemons from the first region easily to the current generation at the time, without having to go through all the hoopla with the Game Boy Color connection. Now we all know and love the Pokemon series. Mostly. But I wanna take a moment to talk about this one small game that just went under the radar of the console and I believe people should at least check out. Summon Knight Swordcraft Story. It's basically the story of this kid who participates in a tournament to become the Craft Lord of Iron. The story gets more complicated of course, but the main attraction is the action battles that are shown like a fighting game from side to side, and you can use different weapons like daggers, axes, and spears. And you can craft them with elemental properties and all, and you can use special abilities with your summon spirit, you can get into a relationship by spending time with some other characters, this game has it all! 
why does no one seriously talk about it? Even freaking Wikipedia! Reception? Yeah, it did good. There has to be something here. By 2006, the DS was already out! Of course nobody cared! This piece of junk was already on this deathbed by the time they realized... Oh yeah, we have a game here! Oh, and it's equal! Yes, there's a sequel that, of course, improves over the first one on pretty much everything and came out in America three months later. That's another one on the list of series that got the big f you. So yeah, these two games are great. You should give them a shot if you're into action RPGs and... Uh, that. Or that. My actual first interaction with the Kingdom Hearts series. How far we've fallen. Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories is the second game in the series. This is the 12th one. It takes place immediately after the first game and puts Sora, Donald and Goofy inside Castle Oblivion in a journey to look for their friends Riku and Kim Mickey and the story just goes nuts from there. Oh, sorry. It gets stupid. This game is also an action RPG but focusing on the usage of cards which governs all the action from all the characters, including the enemies, which made people really upset at the game but personally I loved it, even during my first run. I guess I was just mesmerized with the graphics and just mwah, pixel art. Also the music just slaps my ass cheeks. In general, the GBA wasn't that known for being the best in the musical department, but man, when you get some talented people working on the thing, you get some marbles like, I mean, just everything in this game. Even the actual main theme from the first game is here with vocals and everything, I'm not playing that. And about the gameplay, you can learn new skills by leveling up or find them in chests, that makes sense for this series. That's not saying much. And you can organize your deck around it, by the end of the game you're just taking down fools like it's nothing. I understand why some people don't even bother with this one saying that you should skip to the second game, but I say you should give it a chance. Or the PS2 remake, that's good too. I've been talking really good about the GBA lately, I should look somewhere else for answers. Oh, it's my toilet! Hey man, what'd you get? Oh. oh. You know the GBA is known as the main place to look for ports of SNES games, right? They should have stopped. Tales of Fantasia, a fantastic landmark on the Super Famicom. It never got a release outside of Japan, but thankfully got an English translation by DJAP in 2001. And this is, I believe, where the Tales of series truly started to grow for the rest of the world. We barely got the two games on the PS1, but this version was what truly expanded the series to the masses. And I think the Tales of games wouldn't have the reach they have today if it wasn't for this translation. Not this one. What do you know, the first official version of Tales of Fantasia in the West came in the form of dog sh**. This... this is just bad. Not only are the colors oversaturated, but the music sounds like 8-bit crunch, the gameplay is somehow even slower, and the less we talk about the voices, the better. What the heck is that? I thought, exactly. The GBA was also known for some stinking port, just some foul dookies in the form of a blue splat. Sonic the Hedgehog came out the same year as the 360 game. What was the plan here, Sega? The screen got zoomed way the hell in, it runs like a kidney stone, and the music is even crunchier. The GBA was capable of much more, and Sonic himself shows it with the Sonic Advance trilogy. These games were incredible, adding gameplay improvements on top of each other, making the third the best of them all. It came out two years prior to this one, so there was no excuse. And good lord, have you seen the GBA port of Mortal Kombat 3? No. Good, let's keep it that way. Now, after a brief intervention with the toilet, I should check out... Um... Oh, my left hand! No wonder it's a leechy. Mother 3, the final iteration of the series, this game just makes me sad. Not just because it will probably never come out officially outside of Japan, with so many things that might be considered controversial nowadays, but also because the story itself is just heart-wrenching. I'm not gonna get into details, but the things go from bad to worse for these characters, but it does give you a feeling of hope throughout. The gameplay is an improved version of Earthbound with a rhythm style pressing depending on the enemy. And what of your partner is a dog, this game is perfect! I still personally prefer Earthbound, but man, if someone told me that they prefer Murder 3... Still waiting on it, huh? <laughs> what? What? Okay, so what's left on the chopping block? More SNES ports? Yo, that's like two thirds of the GBA library! They really need some original stuff in there! Okay, to be fair, the SNES didn't have Final Fantasy 4... Stop at 3. The Final Fantasy games were sort of enhanced ports of the originals, plus 5, and tactics, which, I mean, it's godlike. All the ports are better graphics, new optional dungeons, and just felt more complete. The only problem... You don't wanna be caught listening to that... Yo, what the fuck? Ah, 
The GBA just wasn't capable of reproducing music like the SNES. And sure, they tried the best they could, but it still felt like a downgraded version even though it had more and better content. That's when fans come to the rescue. A mod that puts back the music from the original Super Nintendo versions, which funnily enough, actually works on the GBA, not just emulators. And there's also a new menu to listen to the entire soundtrack for each game. So if you have a flashcard, these are the definitive versions to play. Urgent news! More than a seven. But that still begs the question, if a restoration patch can add the soundtrack, which sounds almost the same as the original, why weren't they capable at first? Personally, I think they would have to create a sound engine to emulate the music. Again, games that were created from the ground up for the GBA can have fantastic soundtracks, so it becomes hard not to argue. Everyone comments about the GBA version of SNES games always being inferior, but it doesn't have to be. And if you don't believe me, just look at New Super Mario Land running on a Super Nintendo. Sure, it was made just a few years ago, but it shows that if you really know what you're doing, you can create something beautiful. Jesus, finally! <laughs> The Golden Sun series, one of my favorite dead friends. This, right here, is what cemented my love for RPGs, hell, maybe even for games in general. They are turn-based RPGs with your basic stats like attack, defense, speed and luck, but they add a bunch of stuff to spice up the gameplay. You have Psy Energy, which is basically magic, but you can use some of them outside of battle, affecting the environment and helping to solve puzzles. And indeed, these games have tons of puzzles, please yes and thank you. Both games share one story where the ending of one leads directly to the next, and funnily enough, the second game has the subtitle The Lost Age, but the first one also has a subtitle in Japan, The Broken Seal, alluding to the seal on alchemy being broken at the beginning of the game. The characters are all just fantastic, but the games do have the issue of drawn out conversation that seem to last forever, especially when they mention something that was literally just said, like that one kid in class that wants to repeat what the teacher just explained. That kid's not a girl. But that's it. I guess that's my only complaint with the series, they're just so fun. They even added these little things called gins which serve as power-ups during battle, but also can increase your stats, change your jobs, and with that there's high energy available for each character. And if you set your gins, you can use summons to just decimate enemies. The world of Warrior is massive, especially in the second game where you can go just about anywhere. And don't forget, are you seeing these graphics? Almost 3D sprites on a handheld? Golden Sun and The Lost Age are some of the games that I can honestly say I have no idea how many times I've been them, they're that special to me. And even if I don't have a way to show my story with the games in physical form, the feelings that they brought are real, and that's something that will never be denied. There were some more games that deserve a special mention like Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland, an enhanced remake of Kirby's Adventure on the NES. You see, it's not always about the Super Nintendo. Three about a thousand I bet. Also the Shaman King Master of Spirits games, nice bite-sized worlds that you can play at any moment and come back to, with fun gameplay and so many abilities to try. Advanced Wars, considered one of the best strategy games in the system, alongside Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones. People are gonna kill each other for that. Mario Kart Super Circuit, a mix of the SNES and N64 versions with fantastic music and some fast pace similar to Super Mario Kart. Not the best in the series, but damn it I love it! Oh, and the Donkey Kong Country games, why? The GBA will always be my favorite handheld, even though there were some problems with the sound not being utilized to the best of its abilities, screen crunch for some games, and downgraded ports, it still managed to pull out amazing experiences that weren't even possible on the Super Nintendo. Even though people consider the GBA just a portable SNES, it was a powerful little system, and I'm glad that Nintendo and the third party companies managed to make this a long standing and beloved console. When people look back on the GBA, they see nothing but fondness and of course, I gotta agree. It wasn't about churning out as much stuff as possible, it was about doing things with love and creating the best games they could and having to sustain the test of time and gaming just can't get any better than this. It just can't.